Hello and welcome to Calvary Chapel Comma Key. Today we will continue our study in the Gospel of Mark. Today we'll be in chapter 15 and uh, it's the 11th of June 2022. So welcome aboard as we continue with the Gospel of Mark and today will be chapter 15. I want to do a quick review of the previous chapter. So it's been a while since I actually taught that but I just wanted to go through uh, 14 just some highlights um, you know so we can uh, consider the the context of where we're going that's always smart to do we let scripture interpret scripture and so in chapter 14 we see that there's a plot to kill Jesus remember this is his last week in Jerusalem before he goes to the cross and we've already made the point that he's being scrutinized by the religious people including the what's called the Sanhedrin the council of the Jewish religious system and so there's a plot to kill Jesus then we saw in chapter 14 uh, this woman anointing Jesus body while he's alive it's almost a picture of where he's on his way to and that would be uh, the cross and a grave and so we see that in Bethany we see that sadly Judas agrees to betray uh, Jesus and then there's this scene in the upper room uh, uh, where we get the uh, what's called the upper room discourse probably uh, clearly in the Gospel of John uh, and uh, Jesus says one of you will betray me and then all of them uh, ask the Lord is it me but we see that Judas has in his heart to betray Jesus uh, just for money and uh, as a reminder during this week uh, the whole um, city is full of extra people there to celebrate the feast of passover and unleavened bread that's coming up and so they have what's called or what's known as the last supper in the upper room uh, and and so i invited you to do some research to find out well what what did they eat what did it look like it's called the seder um, and it's uh it's the passover meal uh, so we see that in verse 22 and following that Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper and we connect the dots that it's actually in Jesus shed blood on the cross that now uh, incorporates, uh, introduces the new covenant in his blood. The old covenant was really based on a sacrificial system with the blood of animals. Jesus now uh, steps on the scene and it's his own blood that will cover all of the sin of the whole world but especially for those who put their trust and faith in that finished work and uh, Jesus predicts in verse 27 uh, Old Testament scripture that him being the shepherd will be uh, stricken and that the sheep will be scattered and so that comes to pass and we see uh, that he has prayer time in the Garden of Gethsemane Gethsemane literally means olive press so it's an olive uh, tree olive grove and uh, we see especially in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus is uh, in such turmoil that his sweat becomes like uh, drops of blood and so uh, this idea of an olive press and then we see the betrayal of uh, Judas in the Garden of Gethsemane uh, still kind of reviewing chapter 14 uh, then there's these two verses uh, that, that none of the other Gospels have in verse 51 and 52 and where it says a young man is there uh, and uh, part of the group and he flees naked and many would make the case that that is Mark himself probably a teenager and then Jesus faces the Sanhedrin uh, the Council of 70 the religious uh, rulers and finally at the end of the chapter uh, we see that Peter does deny his Lord three times just as Jesus predicted he would you know not just a worldly prediction but a biblical prophecy that comes to light uh, praise the Lord that you know God and his love for his creation is always about reconciliation with us and so we see that that happens with Peter later on but now we'll uh, make our way to chapter 15 but one of the things from chapter 14 in the upper room at the end of supper it says that they sang a hymn and I left it with kind of a question of as homework for for
for everyone who was interested in that. And, and so we can turn to the book of Psalms, and let's look at Psalm 113. Now, starting with Psalm 113, there's a section of Scripture that's known as the Hallel Psalms, um, uh, literally meaning praise the Lord, and that's what, how these Psalms start many times. Uh, for example, in Psalm 113, it says, Praise the Lord is the opening verse. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. And these are songs that uh, we know from history that the Jews, when they would be traveling from uh, distant places on their way to Jerusalem for Passover, especially, they're singing these Hallel songs. And so, uh, so when we read even in our passage in Mark in chapter 14 where they sang a hymn after supper, many would make the case that they sang what is known as the Great Hallel, and that would be Psalm 136. So I'm going to turn there real quick. Psalm 136, I believe it is. Just going to check my notes just, just to make sure I've got that correct. So my notes are back in Psalm 113. And um, I have in my notes that Psalm 136 is known as the Great Hallel Psalm. And this is possibly the psalm that they sang at the end of supper. I'll just read a few uh, verses. The Bible says in Psalm 136, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. So this repeating line, there's a statement about how good God is, and then the answer is, for his mercy endures forever. Um, I imagine the, the possibility of when you sing that, that they would be like a, uh, maybe the men and the women, the, the men would sing a line and the women would uh, call back, for his mercy endures forever, or vice versa. But I'm sure it would be quite beautiful. And so that's just something, uh, you know, a little, um, uh, maybe a glance at what, was actually being sung uh, at the end of the supper. But now let's look at chapter 15. Chapter 15 has 47 verses, and, and really just like chapter 14, and all the way to the end of the book, it's such familiar passages that I'm going to let the Bible just speak for itself, and I'm going to bring up maybe some comments as we go. Uh, and really the homework will be uh, based on uh, if you would like to, to reference other scripture connecting with our passage in, in chapter 15. And so uh, those would be, here's some reference uh, places in the Bible, and this is going to be a short list, and you can add to it yourself, that you can connect with where we are and where we're going. So Psalm 22, it's known as a Messianic Psalm, Psalm 22 for your notes, Go through Psalm 22, and as, as we connect with Mark 15, you know, and, and really 14, 15, 16, connect with Psalm 22. The next one would be Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53 is known as the chapter that presents this idea of this future Messiah that will come onto the scene, and uh, Jesus will be uh, presented as a suffering servant. And so... Uh, during the week that we're talking about in Mark 15 now, leading up to the cross, a lot of people were confused. You know, they were expecting a conquering king, not a suffering servant. But the Bible makes it very clear, even what we call the Old Testament, that this is what was going to happen. So, so Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, and then specifically, there's a, a verse in Isaiah 53 that is actually connected with 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24 that's 1 peter 2 24 and you'll see that 1 peter 2 24 is like a perfect commentary connecting with uh, a section in psalm or in isaiah 53 so you'll see that but uh, i'm going to leave that now as just an open idea for your further study uh, for you bible students like me who you know you just can't get enough of the word and it's so important, you know, that uh, uh, th that is God's word in our life, that we just can't get enough of it, and we keep digging deeper and deeper. And when we do that, the Lord blesses that idea. You know, and we realize right away we can't come to the end of it. It's too big. And so let me just 
read uh, section by section in Mark 15, and maybe I'll make some comments as we go. It says in uh, verse 1 of Mark 15, immediately, remember immediately is a word used a lot in the Gospel of Mark, in the morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council, so we could consider that that's the Sanhedrin, and they bound Jesus, led him away, and delivered him to Pilate. Now remember, Pilate is kind of a, a governor under the system of the Roman Empire. He's not Jewish, so they lead him. So it's the Jewish religious council leads Jesus bound to Pilate. Then Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? So let's pause right there. So Pilate, somehow, some way, he's heard something that indicates that, is this possible? Now, we're going to see that I don't think Pilate is uh, concerned about this title that's put on Jesus. I don't believe that Pilate has any fear in that sense. See, he serves Caesar. And in the Roman Empire, uh, Caesar is really a title, not a name, uh, is known as a god. So he just asked this question, are you the king of the Jews? He answered and said to him, it is as you say. So he doesn't, Jesus doesn't answer with much detail. Uh, but we can consider that Jesus admits that, yes, you know what? He is the king of the Jews. In fact, Jesus is the king of kings and lord of lords. Jesus would be also known the king of Caesar in that sense. That's who he already is. Okay, so let's move on. Verse 3, and the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. So so consider this, the chief priests, the religious people, are at least involved in this, where they're still accusing Jesus in front of Pilate. Then Pilate asked him, that's Jesus again, saying, Do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you. Now this is where we can especially uh, connect dots with Isaiah chapter 53. Okay, And we're going to see prophecy hundreds of years before the life of Jesus that come true during this whole thing. But Jesus still answered nothing so that Pilate marveled. Very interesting. Verse 6. Now, at the feast, he was accustomed, that is Pilate, to releasing one prisoner to them, whomever they refused. So apparently Pilate has this idea to make the Jewish people there, you know, under his control happy once a year. He would release a prisoner Okay, so we goes on to uh, verse 7. And there was one named Barabbas who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder in the rebellion. So Barabbas is a murderer. And, uh, you know, we're going to see that, uh, among other things, the people, uh, maybe even part of this group, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, uh, on the Sunday before, on the foal of a donkey, and, and people were shouting praises to the Lord and Hosanna, meaning save now. Uh, they, they've turned now uh, completely. They've done a 180, and now they're ready to kill Jesus. And uh, let's continue on. Then the multitude, crying aloud, began to ask him to do just as he had always done for them, that is to release a prisoner, but Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Do you want me to release Jesus? For he knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. Very interesting. Interesting that Pilate knew that. I think Pilate, you know, he was using his brain. He was watching what was happening. And he sees that there's jealousy on the part of these religious leaders. Verse 11, but the chief priest stirred up the crowd so that he should rather release Barabbas to them. Now let's talk uh, a little bit about just even the definition of this name Barabbas. Bar in Hebrew means son. This literally means son of the father. Now that's interesting because we know that Jesus is the son of the true father. You know, God himself is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three persons in one being. There's one God, we know him through scripture, uh, uh, as three persons in one God. 
So, uh, so here's this guy who is definitely a criminal. It says that he's already in prison because he's a murderer. And now this crowd is asking for this murderer, Barabbas, son of Abba, uh, son of the father, uh, to be released. Now, this is a false son of the father, in a sense. The, the one and only true son of God the Father is Jesus. He's the only one. And, and so it's interesting and sad when you consider that the crowd, they want this false guy released, a criminal, a murderer, uh, and someone completely innocent, uh, that is Jesus himself, to now be crucified. We're going to see that. Pilate answered and said to them in verse 12, what then do you want me to do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? Now, as a reminder, I'm always inviting you to look at all of the Gospels, the harmony of the Gospels. Let them kind of fill in blanks. We're going to see in the other Gospels clearly that Pilate three times says that I find no fault in this man, speaking of Jesus. Uh, so Pilate answered and said to them, Again, what then do you want me to do with him, that's Jesus, whom you call the king of the Jews? 13, so they cried out again, crucify him. Then Pilate said to them, why, what evil has he done? But they cried all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. Now, there's a lot going on here, but I'm letting Scripture just play its way out and to speak for itself. Um, this is very familiar uh, passages for most of us. Uh, but just as a reminder, uh, crucifixion um, is something that Rome didn't invent. Uh, it goes back to empires before Rome, but Rome um, actually took, took it to a, a different level. And even leading up to crucifixion, where it says they scourged him in verse 15, we don't need to pass that too quickly. Uh, the scourging was something that actually could kill people. And, and a person was bent over with their backs bared, and this whip was used with, most would say, broken glass, broken bones uh, on the tips of it, um, also known as a cat of nine tails. And... Uh, they would be whipped, or also known as scorched, to the point where their back, their flesh is laid open, and it would be excruciating. Uh, however, that word excruciating is left for the word crucifixion. That's where we get it. If, I'm in, if I would say I'm in excruciating pain, I'm using uh, and I'm connecting with the word crucifixion. That's where that word comes from. So this is lead, leading up to even more pain. But um, in general, Rome, they would scorch people, and it was more of a, um, a science to them to get people to talk. You know, they're, they're looking for witnesses. They're, they're looking for a complete story. You know, something happens, and they grab someone who they think is involved in it, and they would scourge them. Now, obviously, it was so painful that people would say just anything to make it stop. They would even admit to crimes they didn't commit. So here's Jesus, and they scourge him. Now, when we connect with Isaiah 53, and, and we've already seen it where Jesus being accused, he keeps his mouth shut. And Isaiah 53 says that clearly in prophecy. Uh, we can consider that Jesus didn't scream out even in the scourging, but we know that it must have been very painful. Okay, so, so there's that. So we've talked about the word excruciating connected with crucifixion and the scourging is something that we read it in verse 15 and it might be easiest just to go through that really quick, but we need to ponder these things. It's something big. Let's look at verse 16 now. Then the soldiers, that would be Roman soldiers, led him away into the hall called the Praetorium. And so that would be kind of the, the headquarters for the governor. And they called together the whole garrison, and they clothed him with purple. Remember, purple is kind of a color of deity, or a royalty, I guess more specifically. And they twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. You know, when you consider thorns, and, and uh, we see in Scripture where th the idea of thorns coming into the world was 
directly connected with sin. When sin entered into the Garden of Eden, then Jesus, or God, pronounces that the, even the earth would be cursed and that, that man would work by the sweat of his brow, even tilling the ground, and there would be, you know, thorns. And so thorns come about, about because of sin and a curse put onto the earth. It's interesting that this whole picture of what Jesus is doing, he's actually becoming a curse for us. He's taking the curse upon himself. Even, even our sins themselves, he puts upon himself. And so even the crown of thorns even connects with that. I'll let you look that up in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, you'll read about that. And so they twist a crown of thorns, put it on his head, verse 18, and began to salute him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they struck him on the head with a reed and spat on him. Remember, that's already happened with the religious leaders. And now it's the Roman soldiers doing the same thing. Uh, they, struck, they struck him in the head with a reed and spat on him. And bowing the knee, they worshipped him. Of course, this would be mock worship. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off him, put on his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. Very powerful. Verse 21. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. So at one point, Jesus has someone take his cross, and it's this man, Simon. He's from Africa, and it says that he's the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now, this looks like, well, uh, you know, there's always a reason why names are brought up, but it, it seems camouflaged. So for your homework, other than now comparing Scripture with Scripture, and I gave you the references, look up and find out, if you can, who is Alexander and Rufus? Now, there's going to be at least uh, at least two Alexanders that you know you can find in Scripture. So, so keep it in context. See if you can find something. Let even your internet search help you with that. So, so find out. Well, who is this guy Simon? Is he is he mentioned any further in Scripture? So that's number one. And who are his um, the sons, Alexander and Rufus? And why why are they here? And so you might find some interesting uh, information as you do your search. As he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross, and they brought him, in verse 22, to a place called Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. Now, um, Bible students, you, you already know that uh, another word that would be more Latin would be Calvary, you know, or Calvary Chapel, and Calvary... Um, connects exactly with Golgotha, meaning the place of a skull. Now, uh, I've been to Israel, and I was so blessed to see the area where they speculate where the cross was, and there's this place where even though the land right there, there's cliffs that uh, actually look like a skull. Now, we don't know if that's why it's called that or not. We don't know if maybe it's where all these terrible crucifixions were happening, and so even uh, bones were left over because we need to know uh, that generally in history, after a crucifixion, they would leave the body out in open air and let the birds and the animals eat away the flesh, and the bones would just stay there. And so maybe it's called the place of a skull because of even that. And so, you know, we don't know for sure, but something to think about. So Golgotha would translate with the word Calvary. In verse 23, then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. Now, this is a mixture that uh, generally you read in history. It's uh, women that would be around uh, the crucifixions. They were providing a little bit of mercy for the person being crucified. They, this drink, this mix would dull the pain. But we see that Jesus refused to take that. So um, interesting to think about. Verse 24, And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. And so uh, I gave you the reference of Psalm 22. You can read some connections even with his garments in this situation here. In prophecy, uh, verse 25, Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. Now the third hour, so the first hour would be uh, basically 6 a.m. 
in the Jewish reckoning, and the third hour would that would make it 9 a.m. Then we're going to see that even uh, noontime is referenced, and even three o'clock in the afternoon will be referenced because there's going to be darkness over over the land. And it says in verse 26, and the inscription of his accusation was written above the king of the Jews. There's more information, a little bit more in the other gospels that I invite you to connect with and uh, get the bigger picture. In verse 27, it says, with him, they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says he was numbered with the transgressors. And that connects with also Isaiah 53, you'll find out. Now, uh, it says here in verse 29, And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. They're taking something Jesus said out of context. Um, he did say that you can destroy this temple, meaning his body, but it will rise again, and that's going to happen on the third day. They take things out of context and twist what Jesus said or meant, and they thought he was talking about the temple, but he's talking about his body. Verse 31, likewise, the chief priests also mocking among themselves with the scribes said, he saved others, so they know that. They know that he saved others. He healed in, in all these uh, miracles that he did. Himself he cannot save. So we can connect uh, in other gospels that Jesus mentions that there's a certain amount of legions of angels that he could call uh, upon and they would come to save him. But he willingly goes to the cross and he, in his love for us, he takes our sin upon him. So, so no one is actually taking his life. The Lord is laying it down. See, he's on a mission from his father, and he's going to complete it perfectly. Uh, but I'm going to let you, maybe in homework, find out how many legions did the Lord say he could call upon? And then do some extra homework with that question. How many are in a legion? And, and so then in total, how many angels could he call upon? Now, we see in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, that one angel can do a lot of, um, you could say, damage, or you could say protection. You know, so it's just something to think about. So they say he saved others, but himself he cannot save. Oh, yes, he could if he wanted to. Let the Christ, now remember, uh, this is an English transliteration that is really based on the Hebrew word uh, we say in English, Messiah, Mashiach. The king of Israel descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Now the other gospels, especially Luke, will give us more information that one of the two that's crucified with him uh, sees that, wait a minute, this is the Messiah. And then he has a conversation with his Messiah and says, please remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then Jesus says, I, I say today you'll be with me in paradise. Isn't that amazing? So, so what we see here, and maybe we can connect it with our our little bubble in the world, that not everyone in our uh, bubble will, will come to faith in Christ. But that doesn't change what we're about. See, when we live in obedience, then now we're reflecting the love of Christ with anyone and everyone that comes into our bubble. And regardless of the outcome, I'm, outcome we're just being uh, obedient to the call to be an ambassador of Christ as we're passing through this world that's not our home. Uh, it's up to the Lord to save someone. Uh, he just invites us to be obedient and that we can be used for his glory and for his purposes. And that's what we see Jesus doing. Um, so uh, they reviled him. And then in verse 33, now when the sixth hour had come, so if the first hour is 6 a.m., then the sixth hour would be noon. Uh, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, and that would be three in the afternoon, or military time, 1500. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, okay, so, so you have the sixth hour uh, over the whole land until the ninth hour, and then now at the ninth hour, Jesus says, 
Eloi, Eloi, Lama, Sakabathani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, I've already given a reference of where you might find that, but part of the homework is find it. Find where Jesus uh, is now quoting from Scripture, and, and you're going to find it easily in the references that I gave you already. So he says something very powerful. My God, why have you forsaken me? And, and so there's lots of confusion, confusion and, you know, with Bible teachers right now as far as what they're putting out and what this means. One thing that I humbly say, but boldly, that Jesus never stopped being God. So we know uh, our one God that from the Bible is Father, Son, Holy Spirit revealed in Scripture. I absolutely believe that Scripture proves that Jesus never stopped being God. Now there's teaching out there that there was a moment in time where Jesus stops being God. I don't believe that. I don't teach that. Um, and I can say it boldly that Scripture would not even... Uh, you know, say that either. And so that's how I can be bold about this. But when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We see in scripture that God is perfectly holy. In fact, he invites his creation. Uh, one of the themes of scripture is that we are to be holy as he is holy. And we realize, well, wait a minute, I can't do that. I can't be perfect. I can't be holy like God. I can't be uh, who God is. And so one of the things... God does when we put our faith in the finished work of Jesus is that now he's working in us and now there's this transformation and uh, creation originally Adam and Eve they were made in the image of God spirit soul and body but when sin came in you know uh, even Satan you know tempting uh, Eve you know and he says you will not surely die like God said by disobeying him well I believe that yes, yes they did and yes we did. Uh, when sin came in and we were disobedient in sin, then we, we died spiritually instantly and we started dying physically at that point. I don't think that was the original plan of God, but God knowing everything, he knew what would happen and then he starts revealing his plan of salvation and reconciliation through his son, Yeshua, the Mashiach. Uh, and so... So when we consider uh, all of Scripture where it says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, possibly we can connect that also with uh, Psalm 22 and other Scripture even, that uh, it is very possible that God the Father looked away. You know, we, we can prove a point in Scripture that God uh, chooses not to look upon sin. And so maybe that's what, what this is leading to. But I can tell you um, confidently that Jesus did not stop being God even for a moment. Uh, and so what, what I do understand from Scripture is that all of sin of the whole world, past, present, future, was put upon Jesus as a perfect lamb uh, in sacrifice. And he defeating death and rising uh, to be seated in the right hand of majesty uh, also proves that he is the accepted uh, sacrifice. God the Father accepts the perfect sacrifice of his son Jesus. So he sent Jesus to the earth to be the sacrifice. Jesus being completely God and completely man goes through uh, perfectly, um, completely his mission rises, ascends into heaven, is seated at the right hand of uh, power, you know, in majesty. And he is the accepted uh, Lamb of God, you know. And so a lot to think about. And so let's move on to verse 35. Some of those who stood by when they heard that said, look, he is calling for Elijah. Now there's speculation. Uh, is it really mostly Roman soldiers that misunderstand what he said? Because Roman soldiers probably in general didn't understand Hebrew very well. Um, they, they were speaking either Latin or probably uh, Greek. And so, you know, just something to think about. Then someone in verse 36 ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine, put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink saying, let him alone. Then saying, let him alone, let us see if Elijah will come to take him down. So there's misunderstanding of what he said. 
And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. It's a beautiful picture of what God the Father did. He, he now opened the doorway, if you will, into his throne room. And so all of those who will put their, their trust in Jesus now is invited into the Holy of Holies. But remember that curtain was very thick, very heavy, and it separated an area where the priest could go into this area called the Holy of Holies that only the chief priest could go once a year, the Day of Atonement. And so now at this point, uh, God has now opened that door uh, uh, perfectly, uh, a one time, uh, it's, it's open and available to anyone who would walk in and receive. And so Jesus cries out, uh, the veil is torn, verse 39. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. So, so here's a centurion. I think that we can guess our way through that he was not a believer and who Jesus was probably didn't know much about him. But he even makes the point. He, he sees something. He experiences something that leads him to believe that this is the son of God pretty powerful. Verse 40, there were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Less, and of Joseph and Salome. Uh, we can connect the other Gospels. We find out that even Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, was there. We know that uh, uh, close enough that there's a conversation between Jesus and her and the Apostle John. And so I'll leave that to you to look up if you're interested verse 41, who also followed him, these women, and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. So we see that uh, there's many women that played a very important role in the life of Jesus, ministering to him, you know, and I think that's just a beautiful picture, you know, uh, these women who had a servant's heart, and, and uh, you know, it makes you think, did they actually hear when Jesus said that I came to serve and not be served? And, and they, they took that upon themselves and, and they followed a life that was uh, helping Jesus that would be pleasing to the Father. And that should be us as well. And then in verse 42, our last section. Now when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath. So, so there's speculation that this could be like, okay, so you have a Passover, which would also be known as a Sabbath day, but then it's connected with the, the Friday night, uh, the Sabbath. There's preparation not only for the Passover, but also for every weekend, if you want to call it that. Um, that is the day before the Sabbath. Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member, so he's one of the council, one of the Sanhedrin, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And Pilate marveled that he was already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Then he bought fine linen, took him down and wrapped him in the linen, and he laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph observed where he was laid. Now, so Joseph is a prominent member of the uh, Jewish council. And we can actually connect him through the other gospels with Nicodemus. Remember Nicodemus of the Gospel of John chapter 3 and the, and the whole be born again passage, that's Nicodemus. Uh, we see that Nicodemus in the other Gospels will, will be connected with Joseph of Arimathea as they prepare the body of Christ. And it's interesting that, uh, like I said, history would prove that most people that were crucified would just be laying open air. And the birds uh, of the air and the, the animals, whether they're wild or not, would... Uh, eat the flesh away, and they would just, they would just go that way. But we see that uh, also, once again, there's a prophecy that comes true during these passages, and I'm gonna leave it to you um, to find out, for example, uh, Jesus being um, 
you know, between two thieves, two criminals, and then put, put in a tomb. You can connect that with some, uh, some uh, passages in the Old Testament that were prophecy. And, and so even at the death of Jesus, after he's dead, his body is dead, prophecy is still coming true. So we see that there's well over 350 prophecies of Jesus uh, in his life, uh, in his death, in his resurrection that come true. You know, and we've talked about the chances of that happening are minimal. And so that's chapter 15 of Mark. So I hope uh, that for you Bible st uh, students who like to do a little bit extra, that there's enough in here for you to do. And then if you're not one of those uh, people uh, and uh, you know, you're just watching the video, I hope that uh, you're blessed. And I pray that we, uh, we don't just pass through verses uh, too quickly, especially ones that talk about the scourging of Jesus and we consider what actually happened and, and the crucifixion and even connecting the word excruciating with the word crucifixion. And, you know, uh, so Jesus did amazing things, um, but we can consider that many people in history have been crucified, but Jesus is the only one in history who has taken upon himself the sin of everyone else and that he experienced firsthand the wrath of his father. Um, you know, so that sin was actually once for all even punished. And now we live in this realm, especially as a member of church. See, church is the body of Christ. We're the bride of Christ. We're, we know in Ephesians, even the building of Christ. You know, he's the foundation and we're built upon him. Uh, we live in this time of anticipation of his return. But while we're uh, anticipating that, uh, we're living a life that now is uh, completely and radically changed. You know, we've been changed and we're still being changed. Another way of saying it is we're being renewed and transformed into the image of God. And that's, that's an ongoing process until we get our new bodies and we're in the presence of the Lord. So all these things we consider, we think about, and we have a heart of thanksgiving. And we can be encouraged because... Uh, the God of all creation loves us, and he's proved that, not only on the cross, but even every moment as we live our lives. And so until next time, God bless.